physicist, <laughs> mathematician, and we've been, we've been um, discussing a lot of issues. As you can see now, there's beginning of controversy. Not everybody agrees about what we're saying. Uh, we've been talking about um, Leonard saying everything is probabili probabilistically deterministic. And um, Henry, of course, comes from the Heisenberg School. And uh, therefore, the Copenhagen School, would we say that? I would say the von Neumann School, which is uh, an extension of the Copenhagen School. The Copenhagen School was just emphasizing predictions, whereas von Neumann wanted to take those ideas and uh, make them into an ontology. In other words, a theory of reality itself. And uh, the Copenhagen interpretation didn't want to go that far. So Henry, <laughs> why bring mind into the dynamics as an independent variable instead of allowing all mental properties to be determined by physical properties as in classical physics, which is exactly what Leonard was suggesting. <laughs> First of all, do you agree with Leonard? Uh, I didn't hear all of Leonard's comments, but uh, I was backstage. And, uh, but the reason to bring mind uh, into the ontological picture, into the picture of reality, is in order to get a comprehensive and rationally coherent view of nature that encompasses human beings as well as the, the laws of nature. Um, now, a rationally coherent uh, conception, I want to distinguish that from the classical. In classical physics, it's often said that the scientist wears two hats. When he's in the laboratory, he believes classical mechanics, which tells him that his mental intentions and uh, uh, actions have no effect on the world, that the brain is generating all of this as kind of, a, and he has an illusion that he's doing it. But in reality, everything is determined physically. Now, when he leaves the laboratory, he takes off his belief that he has no effect in the world because out in the world, you can't function unless you believe that what you intend to do uh, is gonna have some effect on your actions. So the problem here is then, or the solution here is that, whereas classical mechanics gave you this inconsistent view that you couldn't have an integral view of what reality was like, in quantum mechanics, you do have one coherent conception of the reality that integrates the mental part and the physical part coming from science together into one integrated conception of nature which allows and explains how your free choices act in the physical world and uh, enable you to uh, do your body to do what your mind wills. Your body, of course, does what your mind wills, but you're going a little beyond that. You're saying nature does what you choose, aren't you? What I'm saying is that orthodox quantum theory explains how it is. Uh, in the first place, it brings mind into the picture as an agent. And it also explains to you, or explains, how it is that a mental intent can cause a physical bodily action that is in accord with the intent. So quantum theory then, uh, or orthodox quantum theory, does allow you to bring both sides of nature, the mental with free will, into the scientific uh, description in terms of physical states of the universe together into one coherent. Where does intention <coughs> have its origin? Um, in the mental realm. In other words, Descartes, as you know, separated the world into a physical part and a mental part. So you had two kinds of things. One is the physical thing, and at the beginning of science, uh, Newton essentially took the physical side as the part that he was going to pursue, and uh, uh, somebody like uh, um, Lord Barclay took the mental side, and they pursued, and uh, they led to two different conceptions of the world did not match, as I was just saying. And uh, the quantum rules 
allow you to understand how this thing that's in the mental realm, a conscious intention, can actually, uh, in quantum theory, these mental things enter as agents into the dynamical laws of nature. And, uh, and look at, looking at the details of how it works following the von Neumann mathematics, you can actually see why it is. It explains why it is that this thing in the mental realm so would you agree with uh, uh, Dyson, Freeman Dyson that, that the mental realm permeates the entire cosmos from subatomic to microscopic? Um, let me explain why I would agree. I mean, it's not just enough to say. The reason is that uh, once you pursue the scientific course, uh, you find, first of all, that this classical idea fails. It's, it's not true. And, uh, the, uh, and the replacement that you get, and this is quantum physics, this is orthodox quantum theory, says that what had been the physical universe, made of billiard balls and hard little things, turns into something of a completely different nature. And its nature is that of a potentia, or a potentiality. And uh, you say, potentiality for what? And these are potentialities for events, for psychological events to happen. And the way the theory works is the psychological event happens and it's correlated to a change in the physical world. Uh, for example, a physical world as represented by quantum mechanics without any uh, mental uh, intervention uh, evolves into a smear of all sorts of possibilities. And that's why you say potentialities. And so, uh, at that stage, you, are, you have to introduce mind because mind picks out one thing that does happen. And your, ask, your original question is, why does mind enter in? Well, you have to have mind in in quantum mechanics because without mind, all you have is a smear of all possibilities. You see, in classical mechanics, there was this very close connection between mind and what happened in the physical world. They were kind of one, and you could maybe say they were not clearly distinguished. Some people say you can leave mind out altogether. In quantum mechanics, you can't, because the physical world is a smear of possibilities. And a smear of possibilities is not what is experienced. So you have to have mind to even d distinguish the possible from the actual. How do you account for data that seem to show that an associated <coughs> brain action precedes the mental act of consciously willing one's finger to move? How can a brain event precede the mental intent? Um, if that is true, though. Experimentally, uh, things like that happen. In other words, before your finger moves, there's something that you can have re records of something happening before. and. Uh, uh, and it's well explained and accommodated in quantum mechanics by something that was already an essential part of the theory before those experiments came about that has to do with delayed choice experiments, which you may have heard about. In order to explain these delayed choice experiments, which seemed to indicate a dependence of what happened earlier upon your later experience, you had to distinguish two kinds of pasts. There's the actual past and the effective past. The actual past is this one I've been talking about. It evolves into the smear of all sorts of possibilities. That's how the quantum state of the universe evolves. Uh, now the effective past, well, what happens then is a conscious experience occurs it says that this thing happens, and there the rules tell you, associated with this a conscious experience, there will be a certain collapse of the wave function into the part of the former wave function that is compatible with that experience. And that's the basic idea in quantum mechanics. There's this mental part, and associated with each mental event, there is a collapse of the earlier state of the universe quantum state of the universe, physical state of the universe, into a sub part. And then the effective past is the part of the actual past 
that survived this collapse process. There's a, a way of defining this in a well-defined way. You just look at the part that, that led to what actually did happen. And the way the laws of quantum mechanics work is everything else gets obliterated. And all future experiences will make it appear that the past was the past that led to the thing that actually happened. Any effect or apparent effect of all these other worlds will never be seen. So that's the difference between the actual past, the evolution of all of these possibilities, with <clears throat> the effective past, which is the past that is the past that's going to evolve and uh, give you predictions about everything that's going to happen in the future. And uh, so this also applies in this case that you were mentioning, moving the finger. The, uh, uh, all these, they're called uh, <clears throat> action, uh, um, um, something potentials, and the quantum evolution will evolve all of these readiness potentials. There'll be a whole smear of them. Then when one is picked out, it will collapse into the readiness potential to do a certain action. Suppose I have a mental intent and I'm going to do a certain action. There will be a collapse to just one of these uh, possible readiness potentials from the... Will actualize. Will become actualized, and all future experience will see only that one. So it is kind of an effect, it is an effect on the effective past, mm -hmm. and the effective past is the past that controls all future experiences. I know that, uh, <clears throat> uh, and again, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I know that Aronoff's lab uh, at, your, at Chapman University uh, is talking about something called time-symmetric <coughs> quantum mechanics, where, um, where information from the not yet future leaks into the present and resolves some of the uncertainties mm -hmm. of collapse. Mm -hmm. uh, well, do you, what's your view on that? Uh, you're talking about these BIM experiments that he's reproducing? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, that's a subtlety there. These BEM experiments are such that if you stick with the uh, established laws of quantum mechanics, they would not be permitted. And so even this backward time effect would not be enough. Uh, so it's interesting. If you want to explain in a rationally coherent and very understandable way why these apparent backward time effects occur, you have to say that nature's, uh, I have to back off to say the way that this reduction happens is that the, the observer uh, in, in orthodox quantum theory and also Copenhagen quantum theory, the observer plays an essential role and he has to pose a question to nature. So he asks a question, it's a probing action, and then there's something on the other side called nature. Nature responds, and that's the formal language that's used uh, in, in quantum mechanics. Nature gives a response, and according to the orthodox rules, there's uh, a way of calculating, as Leonard was just saying, there's a way of calculating the probabilities that you're going to get yes or no to some question, for example. And um, so this response on the part of nature is according to these random rules. If you want to explain the BEM experiments, which is what they're trying to do, and by the way, I should say that these experiments have now been replicated in, in six different institutions. So it's not just one thing here. Uh, it's already been replicated six times. Chapman is going to try to do it, and there are other laboratories that are trying to do it as well. Uh, according to the, if you want to explain those results, you have to say that nature's choice is not purely random, it's slightly biased. And what's it biased in favor of? This is kind of amazing. It says it's biased in favor of producing experiences that are positive, pleasing experiences, as opposed to displeasing experiments. The experiments that are under consideration here uh, have uh, the, the subject of the experiment is exposed to different sorts of, of uh, visual 
images, some of which are pleasing, other of which are displeasing, spiders and various things like this. In fact, the spider experiments are some of the most powerful experiments. They're very negative, and the effect of the experiments is that nature's choice, which should be 50-50 according to the way the experiment is set up, with some random number of generators, which are 50-50. Instead, what you find is that these ones that generate these bad experiences are depressed. They don't happen as often as the quantum rules would suggest. So that's a quite astounding uh, discovery. If nature's choice is really depends in such a way that it wants to discourage bad experiences, in these circumstances at least. So that's the uh, outcome. So in answer to the question, orthodox quantum theory does not explain the SPEM experiment. You have to make this modification that I've just described. Last question, and then we'll move on. There are basically three ways, I think, that human beings are, or scientists are now looking at nature or the cosmos. One, we would say dualistic, mind and, mm -hmm. and physical world are two separate things, the Cartesian view, mm -hmm. which doesn't hold any water. So you're let, let, left with non-dual materialism, mm -hmm. non-dual physicalism, or non-dual consciousness. Is there an alternative? Well, the if one there's I'm, only a single reality. The one I'm talking about, uh, you tell me how it fits into that, your separation if possible. The one I'm talking about, uh, it is starting from Descartes' idea that the world has two realms, the mental realm and the physical realm. It does agree with that. It says, yes, you have this, well, at least at first, it agrees with it. You have this physical described realm, and you also have the mental realm. Now, the key point is if you look at the physically described realm, uh, it evolves into these smears of possibilities. So the physical world, at the level of classical mechanics, were these billiard balls, these hard little things that moved around, and you can't suddenly make them all disappear. I mean, that's not how classical ideas work. But the physical world, under the uh, force of the experimental data on on, on atomic systems and things like this, forced itself into a different position where this so-called physical world turned into something that had this potentia idea. So a potentia is an idea-like thing in the sense that it can suddenly change when you get new information. And that's exactly what this thing does. When you get new information, the world, the, the physical world, as described in quantum mechanics, suddenly collapses in a way that's very idealike in its character. So from that point of view, you have moved into, you started along a, a scientific path which was based on a physical world, but you were forced into a different conception of what the physical world was like, and it was more mental. So uh, you have this, the two parts, but in some sense they're both mental. Thank you, Dr. Sarah. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.